and that occurred at approximately you know, nine minutes and 11 seconds. And at that time, you get, you get a minor pogo, but then it stops abruptly as the S2 stage is jettisoned. And it can no longer have a series of compression. Again, the load factors are a lot uh, lower on the S2 stage. We're only up to around two and a half to three Gs when that shuts off. And then uh, the S4B is burning all the rest of the way into orbit. And um, then the final thing is when you obtain the orbital velocity, and that occurred approximately 11 minutes and 40 seconds. I'm perhaps be forgiven for saying that I find that fascinating. We've talked with the astronauts on I don't know how many flights, but always prior to the flight and asked them what they think it's going to be like, what they think it's going to look like and feel like. But this, to my knowledge, is the first time we have had them after the flight and have them tell us uh, not what they expect, but what they experienced. And um, I think it adds something to it. We'll be back in just a moment. The Apollo 11 Saturn V combination which took off from uh, Cape Kennedy about 30 minutes ago, weighed 6,300,000 pounds at the time of uh, firing. Uh, during its journey, it will burn more than 86,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, that was just in the three seconds or so between ignition and liftoff. And from that point on, Apollo 11 will continue to lose weight constantly upon its landing. And when it comes back, it'll weigh a little more than 31,000 pounds. Now let's go to Mark Landsman at Wapaka, Ohio. Tremendous. We're most happy. What is a parent's feelings at a, at a moment like this? It's just a feeling of thanksgiving. Have you been waiting anxiously for this moment? Yes. Yes, we're very happy that the first stage is completed and such a fine takeoff. As you sat and watched the uh, liftoff, did you think about the risks involved? Not so much. I was prepared for that ahead of time. How do you go about preparing yourself? My inner faith helps me. When did you last talk to your son? Yesterday, about noon, we had a nice long talk with him on various subjects, mostly pertaining to the family. The rest of the family is, of course, at the Cape, and our near relatives and even distant relatives are down there to uh, view the launch today. Those were the parents of uh, Neil Armstrong being uh, interviewed by Mark Landsman in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Uh, as we see each one of these launches occur, it uh, may also occur to many of us that as thrilling as these triumphs and successes are, they sometimes have a tendency to produce a backlash of discouragement over our inability to predict or control our weather, to manage our cities and regulate our traffic, to eliminate poverty and crime and educate all our population, house and feed all of our people. At the same time that there is euphoria and triumph, there may also be a backlash of some disappointment because it may occur to us frequently that if we can correlate 22,000 flight steps and 9 million pieces of hardware and make them function as perfectly as all of this. Why are we failing with some of our other problems? Therefore, Apollo 11 increasingly perhaps has become the symbol of a dawning suspicion that political, social, and spiritual excellence may not automatically follow technical achievement, that the two are separate. Many realize that our junkyards, the industrial slums and slag piles, the oceans of beer cans and the urban sprawl are fruits in one way of technological advance. But then on second thought, it may occur to us also that technology can ultimately be applied to yet clean up the mess, which are the disappointing byproducts of this same technology. So Apollo 11 causes us to think most of the 200 million of us are thinking, who are we? Where are we? Uh, is the universe our, our complete oyster? What about our priorities? Did the Russians by any chance in 1957 with Sputnik lead us into a series of bad judgments? Uh, is, it, is it good that we kind of cloak Apollo 11 with theological and 
metaphysical wrappings and second thoughts. For it might yet dawn upon us that a restrained, self-disciplined, and precise life journey here on Earth uh, could produce some comparable results. Well, Frank, uh, I was about to um, put a question to you. But, um, we knew that this was going to occur with Apollo 11. Uh, any free people, I should think, with the freedom to ask difficult questions and a habit of exercising that privilege, would ask, after an investment of $25 billion or so, uh, what is going to be the fruit of all of this? What's it going to yield? What's going to be the return? Uh, indeed, Apollo 11 does come at a time when it's increasingly difficult to sell the concept that we go to the moon just because it's there, or that we think we can do it, or that we go just for the sheer excitement and exhilaration of it. A uh, solution of problems and a list of social political triumphs, uh, it occurs to us, would also yield a great sense of national exhilaration at this point. So as Apollo 11 takes off and the moon journey begins, and uh, as it concludes, I suppose most of us Americans are going to be wondering about our list of priorities. And it was interesting to note that the Reverend Ralph Abernathy of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference led a group of 15 persons, most of them children, to Cape Kennedy to say that the United States should match its efforts in space with a program to feed the hungry on Earth. Abernathy said that America has reached out to the stars but has not reached out to her starving poor. Well, Dr. Thomas Paine, administrator of the space agency, then met with Abernathy yesterday and told him the Apollo would not be sent to the moon if that would solve the problem of hunger in the world. He said the national unity and purpose which makes the moon flight possible also and ultimately can be brought to bear on poverty. Frank? This question that you posed, Chad, about uh, what does it gain us has been posed to um, everyone in the program, I suppose, uh, from the top officials to the astronauts themselves, and it's hardly fair, really, to ask them because their minds don't run in those channels. But it is a good and sensible question to ask. And they have great difficulty in answering because they can't point to anything really tangible. They can't say, look, that thing standing there, whatever it might be, is a result of this program. And the best answer that I've been able to piece together from them, and I don't necessarily accept it as being adequate, but at any rate, it's the best answer that I can recall them having put together, is that out of it will come a technology that the government has succeeded in harnessing the resources of the government, of the scientific community, of the universities, and of industry, and managing this successfully to tackle extremely difficult problems and do extremely unlikely things. This is an accomplishment which cannot be denied, and out of it, good things could happen. We, after all, do have the technology to clean up the water, we have both what they call the software and the hardware to do it. We have the technology, which is to say we know how to clean up the air. We have the software and the hardware to do it. And heavens knows we know how to feed people and we know how to build houses. What is lacking at this point is a determination to use the technology at hand to solve those problems, the will to do it. The, about the only thing that we don't know how to do is change people's minds and make them like each other. That's not a matter for technology. But the rest of it is at hand if the decision is made to do it. David? They're in orbit, and everything is fine. On the um, score, on the subject you were talking about, it seems to me that the flight we have seen begin today was a combining of technology and romance in a way they never have been combined before, which is to say that the engineers now are doing what poets and romantics have imagined. And perhaps there will always be a gap between what man imagines and what he is able to do, because it is easier to think about doing something than it is to do it. But so long as the gap between imagination and reality is not too big, we may even preserve some degree of sanity. 
the alternative is for man to feel bound and limited and held down when what he actually wants to do is move, explore, expand, grow, achieve, and fly. And so with some really splendid engineering we have seen here today, an impressive tribute, by the way, to the talent turned out by American technical schools, one generation of Americans is doing what an earlier generation dreamed about. Floyd Kelber is uh, NBC News correspondent, is uh, on, what is it, the Merritt Island Causeway? What do they call that? Bennett, Bennett Causeway? Which is a place where a lot of visitors have, uh, with campers and trucks and cars and station wagons and so on, have been camped and parked all night waiting to see what we saw a few minutes ago. Floyd? <laughs> 